I'm going to talk to you guys tonight um, about Aquinas and the problem of so-called pagan virtue. Um, and the title of the talk is, Is There Goodness Without God? Pagan is a kind of funny word. We don't usually use that too often. Um, in this talk, it's just referring to um, people outside the Christian moral life, okay? roughly speaking. We can um, come back to that in the question session if, if need be. Um, <clears throat> Augustine, many, some of you probably know, but Ag Augustine purportedly said, um, he apparently didn't actually say this, um, but he, he, he meant it, he, he felt it. He, he's, uh, he's said to have said that the virtues of the pagans uh, were no more than splendid vices. Um, this claim is controversial, to say the least, uh, because it seems to assert, does assert, that every act of a non-believer is necessarily sinful. Um, some Christians believe this is the case. Other Christians do not. Um, it's easy to see why you might think it is the case, right? Because Christians believe that all morally perfect acts are motivated by supernatural love for God. And they also believe that the very ability to have such a motive, supernatural love for God, is impossible without God's saving grace, which is itself a gift from God. Um, so you might naturally conclude that if non-Christians are incapable of morally perfect action, then the only alternative is that every act of a non-Christian is sinful. Indeed, um, some believe that this is the correct interpretation of Paul's claim in Romans 14, 23, all that is not of faith is sin. But even if, the, so there are understandable reasons um, for holding this view, um, but it can also seem kind of harsh, right? Um, for it requires us to agree that many of the actions we have historically admired, and indeed many of the acts we admire in our own acquaintances, are in fact sinful. So it requires us to agree that Socrates was sinning when he died for truth, that the Spartan king Leonidas and his men sinned when they sacrificed their lives to save all of Greece from the Persian hordes, that our atheist neighbor is sinning when she shovels our walk for us, and so on and so forth. And more importantly, even if we agree that Socrates and Leonidas and our atheist neighbor did not act out of supernatural love for God, is the only alternative really to conclude that their acts are sinful? It seems like maybe there could be some kind of middle ground here. So what I want to do tonight is to explain one way of arguing for a middle ground. And um, it's, the, it's the argument that I believe, not everybody, of course, everybody argues about everything. Um, it's, it's the middle ground that I think you find in Thomas Aquinas. Um, I'm going to argue that Thomas Aquinas believes that although true moral perfection is impossible apart from grace, it is still possible for non-Christians to avoid sin in some, indeed many, of their actions and even to develop genuinely good habits. The key to establishing this middle ground is going to be establishing the possibility of acts that are neither sinful on the one hand nor motivated by supernatural love for God on the other hand. So what I'm going to do in what follows is start with an example of an action that intuitively seems like it could fall into such a middle ground. And then I'm going to show how Aquinas' notion, I realize this is a complicated term, but I'm going to explain it. Um, I'm going to show how Aquinas' notion of the good of nature helps to explain what underlies this intuition. And this will turn... Um, will prove to raise a still deeper question. Because even if we concede that the pagan sometimes performs genuinely good acts, that's not yet the claim or, the, or to agree that the pagan can perform genuinely good acts habitually. Moreover, any assertion that the pagan can sometimes or even habitually perform good acts must be able to accommodate the Christian notion of original sin. So after I explain Aquinas' notion of the good of nature, I'm going to do three things. First, I'm going to explain why Aquinas thinks that man can perform acts 
ordered to his natural good without God saving grace. Second, I'm going to explain what it would mean to cultivate the ability to perform such actions habitually, i.e. to cultivate the natural virtues. And then with this groundwork in place, I will conclude by explaining why Aquinas believes that even one who successfully cultivates virtues ordered to his natural good still needs God's saving grace in order to become a citizen of heaven. Okay, so that's where we're going. Um, but I'm going to start now by giving an example that I'm going to return to throughout the paper. So many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this example. 480 years before the birth of Christ, 7,000 Spartans and their Greek allies defended a narrow mountain pass against 100,000 Persian invaders at a place called Thermopylae. The Spartans knew they couldn't hold the pass for long, but they also knew that if they held the pass long enough, they could give their navy time to assemble and fight off the invaders and thus save the lives of their fam or possibly save the lives of their families and countrymen. So the Greeks held the pass for a few days, and then when it was clear that they were going to be overwhelmed, the Spartan king Leonidas dismissed his forces. He and a small group of his men, according to the movie 300, more like two or 3,000, in fact, stayed behind and continued to block the Persian advance while the rest of the Greek forces retreated to safety. So Leonidas and his men were overwhelmed and killed by the Persians as they knew they would be, but by their sacrifice, they saved not only their comrades, but also all of Greece. For centuries, we have praised the sacrifice of Leonidas and his men. The ancient Greeks commemorated the spot with a plaque that still stands today. There are books and movies. But of course, the question I want to raise for us here tonight is how should we should evaluate the actions of Leonidas and his men? Should we agree that Leonidas and all his men, even if they did a good thing, were necessarily driven by sinful motives, right? But should we agree with um, the claim that Augustine seems to be making? I mean, and Augustine's claim is, is its pride, right? If, if you're not a Christian, those acts that look good are in fact driven by vanity, by pride. Now, I think it's likely that at least some of the Spartan 300 plus, sacrifice their lives for sinful reasons like pride. But should we really say that all of them did? Some scholars, most notably Peter Abelard, argue that since God can bestow his grace where he wills, he can also bestow it on pagans. So one avenue, one alternative approach, is to argue that some of the Spartans didn't sacrifice their lives for sinful motives because they, unbeknownst even to themselves, had received God's saving grace and were thus capable, again, unbeknownst even to themselves, of acting out of supernatural love for God. But should we even have to go that far? Couldn't it at least be the case that some of the Spartans were motivated not by pride or personal glory or supernatural love for God, but simply by some genuinely good desire? Couldn't some of them simply have chosen to act as they did because they thought it was the right thing to do? Or because they desired to save their families and countrymen from a grisly fate? In a number of places, but most tellingly in his commentary on Romans 14.23, Aquinas indicates that he thinks that something like this is the case. In his commentary on Paul's claim that all that is not of faith is sin, Aquinas makes a number of important distinctions. First, he distinguishes the believer's relation to good from the unbeliever's relation to evil. The former, says Aquinas, is all or nothing in a way that the latter is not. In one who has living faith, Aquinas says, quote, there is nothing of condemnation, there is no evil. But, he continues, the unbeliever's relation to evil is not the same as the believer's relation to good. That is to say, we can't conclude that just because there is evil in the unbeliever, there is nothing good in him. For even in the unbeliever, there is still what Aquinas will call the good of nature. This means, says Aquinas, 
that the unbeliever does not necessarily refer all he does to an evil end. He has the capacity to refer his acts to something good, which again he calls the good of nature. And because of this, not everything the unbeliever does is evil. Since he has not received God's saving grace, he will be incapable of acting for a perfectly good motive, and his acts will still fall far short of true Christian goodness, but they will also not necessarily be evil. Now clearly, the key to Aquinas' claim that not every act of the unbeliever is sinful is his claim that the unbeliever can refer his acts to a genuinely good end, namely the good of nature. Okay, so we need to spend some time talking about what this good of nature thing is. Um, and so I'm going to explain what Aquinas means by that, and then I'm going to return to the Spartans and talk about what they could have been doing or how that might help to explain why they um, might have, some of them might have performed genuinely good acts. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about this notion of the good of nature. So Aquinas believes that God gives man a great gift merely by creating him, merely by making us to be the kinds of things that we are. If our very creation is a gift, it follows that we as human beings do something genuinely good when we make the most of that gift, when we realize most fully the gift of our creation. So it should, be, it should come as no surprise that Aquinas, following Aristotle, sees a deep connection between what a thing is, its nature, and our assessment of whether any individual thing is good or not. The general idea here is that to say what a thing is is also to indicate the standard that it ought to meet. And that to say a thing is good merely means that it meets that standard. So this is a little complicated, but some examples can help clarify it. So for instance, I suspect that everybody in this room used the word good or some variant of it today. Right? So you might have said that the pizza in the cafeteria was bad or that a professor's lecture was good, or a variety of other things. What do you mean when you say things like that? It seems pretty clear that when you say the pizza in the cafeteria is bad, you mean that there is something pizza is supposed to be, a standard that it's supposed to meet, and that the pizza in the cafeteria doesn't come anywhere close to meeting that standard. Of course, the standard that pizza is supposed to meet is a human invention, and that's why there's so much disagreement over it. But the things we encounter in the world have standards that they succeed or fail to meet, too, and these standards are present in them by nature, in virtue of what they are. And so, for instance, consider what we mean when we say that someone has good eyes. Right? There are things that, only, that eyes and only eyes do, Eyes are things that recognize objects, distinguish things that are near from things that are far away, differentiate colors, and so on. But it's also true that not all eyes actually do these things. Mine do not. Right? When I take off my glasses, I'm completely, um, I don't see anything. Uh, and of, of the eyes that do see, some see them more proficiently than others. So when we describe what eyes are, we're actually articulating a standard. We're saying what eyes should be. And when we say that someone has good eyes, we're simply saying that their eyes meet or exceed the standard of what eyes should be. And a bad eye, similarly, is one that falls short of the standard. Now, I think that such an account of goodness is deeply intuitive. I would go so far as to propose that if we examine the way we use good and bad, we will find, in each case, that we are assuming a standard and making a judgment about whether the thing in question meets that standard. If we accept the idea that nature, what something is, and goodness are connected in this way, then it follows that before we can make a judgment about whether a human being is good or bad, or even make a judgment about whether an individual human action is good or bad, we need an account of what human beings are of what activity or activities are distinctive of human beings. And the answer to this seems fairly clear. Only human beings are capable of rational activity. Only we are capable of using our reason to deliberate about the best way to live our lives. 
Although we have desires and needs and impulses just like any other animal, we, unlike other animals, are not simply bound to follow where our desires lead. Far to the contrary, we have the capacity to think about whether we ought to indulge our desires, even about what we ought to desire, and we can even use our reason to retrain our desires. If we come to the rational realization that we ought to exercise, for instance, we can not only resist our sedentary inclinations, but even retrain them so that we can come to want to do what we know we ought to do. Okay, and this account of human nature leads in turn to an account of the human good. A good human being will be one who performs the activity unique to human beings in an excellent way, one whose actions exhibit the excellence of rational activity. Okay, so all of this, I think, can help explain the admiration we feel for what Leonidas and his men did at Thermopylae. For if, it, if a human action is good when it exhibits what is most special and unique about human beings, then their sacrifice can surely fit the bill. To sacrifice one's life for a good that one correctly recognizes to be higher and greater than oneself, and to do so willingly, even gladly, this is something that only human beings can do. And only a special kind of human being can do it at that. Many of us might well recognize the value of such a sacrifice, but I think none of us can be certain we would actually have the strength to make it, let alone to make it readily and willingly. Leonidas and his men, at least in this isolated instance, seem to have met and exceeded the standards set by their human nature. They seem to have made good use of the gift of their rational human nature. Okay, so... Um, this is what Aquinas means when he says the pagan can avoid sin when he acts in keeping with the good of nature. He's asserting that the pagan avoids sin when he acts in a way that fulfills the gift God gives him in creating him. When he acts in a way that exhibits the specialness of his rational human nature. But even if we accept this, a number of things require explaining. First, even if we agree that good human action is action that, quote, exhibits the excellence of reason, how do we come to know what right reason requires of us in a given situation? Can we know what right reason requires of us without grace? Second, even if we occasionally manage to recognize what is required of us, as Leonidas and his men seem to have, Really fulfilling the gift of our creation would surely mean that we do so consistently, i.e. that we cultivate the virtues. And finally, we haven't said anything about how original sin affects our ability to make the good use that God, of the gift that God gives us in our creation. So I'm going to address each of these points in turn. I'm going to start with this problem of how it is that we can act in accord with right reason. So... I mentioned above that Aquinas thinks the pagan can avoid sin because even pagans can perform acts ordered to their natural good, right? They can make good use of the gift of their rational human nature. But making good use of this gift requires at a minimum that we be capable of realizing what is required of us in a given situation. Even beyond that, really making good use of that gift would mean regularly and consistently recognizing what right reason requires, right? It would require cultivating the virtues. So I'm going to focus on the first step of that, our ability to know what acts are in accord with right reason and which are not. Aquinas believes that even pagans can make good use of the gift of their rational human nature because he believes that doing so requires only what God already gives us when he creates us. Although Aquinas does not believe that anyone is naturally virtuous, he does believe that all human beings are created with the capacity to become virtuous. Aquinas believes that God creates man with a basic orientation to and desire for the good of reason. To put the same point differently, God creates man with a moral compass that points us towards the fulfillment of our rational human nature. He thinks that from our very first interactions with the world, 
we know and are motivated by basic moral principles. Principles which give us an inchoate grasp of and desire for the good of reason. Since he believes that all men have not only this basic orientation to the good of reason, but also reason itself, Aquinas believes that all men have, at least in principle, the capacity to understand what the good of reason requires of them in a given situation. Leonidas and his men didn't merely stumble blindly on the idea that sacrificing their lives to save all of Greece would be a good thing to do. Their very human nature enabled them to see the goodness of such an action. Of course, the basic moral knowledge that Aquinas thinks all men naturally possess is just that, basic. In Aquinas' view, it only provides us with vague and incomplete grasp of the good of reason. The ability to apply that knowledge correctly is something that has to be cultivated. But this, too, is something that Aquinas thinks that even pagans can make progress in. Now, this is not to say, of course, that he thinks that the, cult, that the progress occurs in isolation. He thinks, for instance, he also thinks, for instance, that we are in principle capable of arriving at the truths of mathematics on our own. And we clearly all are, right? Euclid did, Descartes did. Most of us don't. But his point is that in mathematics, as in natural moral reasoning, our reason can arrive at the correct conclusion without divine assistance. A teacher might well help our reason move from one step of the proof to another, and a parent might well help a child to understand why stealing is wrong. In each case, though, when we finally do understand the mathematical proof or the moral conclusion, it will be our reason that does the work. Aquinas's point, then, is that our natural human reason is capable of recognizing certain moral truths, like the wrongness of murder and stealing, on its own, even without God's grace. Cain suffered all the ill effects of his parents' fall from grace, but he still knew he was doing something wrong when he killed Abel. Okay, so it is one thing to agree that even unbelievers are sometimes capable of avoiding sin in some of their acts. But Aquinas seems to go even further than this and to maintain that unbelievers can also cultivate virtues, which is to say habitual dispositions to do good acts. In fact, Aquinas even goes so far as to claim that the pagan can acquire, quote, a habit of virtue through which he can abstain from evil in the majority of cases and chiefly in matters most opposed to reason. So I'm going to briefly describe what such a habit of virtue would be and then I'm going to turn to the issue of original sin. It's not too controversial to say that man is set apart from other things by his ability to reason, or even that good actions are those that exhibit the kind of excellence that men and only men are capable of. We've also seen above that Aquinas thinks that man's very rational nature gives him the capacity to recognize acts that are in accord with the good of reason. But Aquinas also thinks that that capacity has to be cultivated. Why? Well, the key here is that although we are rational, we are also rational animals. We have feelings and fears and desires, all of which can very much affect our ability to be guided by reason in our actions. If you've ever been on a diet, you may have noticed that you come up with all kinds of good reasons not to stick to your diet when you're in close proximity to your favorite dessert. You might tell yourself, for instance, that you'll diet more successfully if you get to indulge sometimes, or that your host will feel bad if you don't just try a little. And if you've had thoughts like those and given in to them, you've probably also noticed that those reasons never seem like good reasons the next day. The point is, our desires can affect the way we rationally perceive the world, even or especially even when we don't know that they're doing so. Breaking a diet is an innocuous example, but other examples abound. We can convince ourselves that it's reasonable to, stand, to stay in a bad relationship, or that it's acceptable to cheat on our taxes, or so on and so forth. And even when our desires don't completely overshadow our reason, they can still cause us to ignore or disregard what we know to be true. 
Although we sometimes convince ourselves that breaking our diets or gossiping about an acquaintance is the right thing to do, most of the time we know full well that those things are wrong. We just do them anyway. And because what we want takes precedence over what we know we ought to do. These examples indicate that our desires can either skew our perception of the good of reason altogether, or at least cause us to ignore what we know to be the case. But reason and desire don't have to be at odds in that way. Aquinas, like Aristotle, held that reason has what he called political rule over the passions. Our passions are not rational, but they can nonetheless participate in reason. Reason cannot con completely control the passions, but it can entreat and convince and guide them. In a disordered soul, passions either control or overshadow reason, and the rational part of us is at the mercy of the non-rational part. In a well-ordered soul, on the other hand, the passions are guided and influenced by the highest part, reason. Rather than distorting one's perception of the good of reason, everything in the well-ordered soul works towards the accurate perception of the good of reason. If we can all think of examples where our passions have distorted our perception or caused us to act against our better judgment, we also all know people who don't seem to struggle with their desires in this way. We all know people who are not just healthy, but who seem not to struggle to remain so. People who not only drink moderately, but who would not enjoy themselves if they drank immoderately. Or people who not only stick to an exercise routine, but derive great satisfaction from doing so. And more importantly, we've all seen instances where individuals who have performed some great act of heroism insist that they did nothing more than anyone would have done, that they couldn't have acted in any other way. Chances are they really mean this. We, the less brave, could have acted in other ways, but the truly brave feel compelled to act as they do. Rather than distorting their perception of reality or holding them back, the passions of true heroes actually help them do the right thing. What we see in cases like these is a harmony of reason and desire. The temperate person accurately assesses how much it is appropriate to eat or drink or exercise, and that is precisely what they want to do. The courageous person accurately sees that someone needs saving or that someone's honor needs defending, and that is what they want to do. There is no struggle, no self-deception, simply the unified action of a unified self. It follows, then, that if the pagan is to be genuinely virtuous, capable of consistently recognizing and doing what the good of reason requires, he must be capable of cultivating the right order of reason and desire in his soul. Now, Aquinas thinks that pagans can make progress towards virtue, but he also thinks that original sin prohibits the nat that natural virtue from ever being complete. Okay, so, so far I've been painting a really a somewhat pretty, some might say really optimistic picture, right? Because I've said our very human nature gives us the resources to pursue our fulfillment. And I've said that as we cultivate this ability, perhaps with the help of good teachers, we not only refine our ability to distinguish right from wrong, but also cultivate virtuous habits. But Aquinas is also a Christian. <laughs> also. Uh, and, and one of the things he believes as a Christian is that our human nature is corrupted by original sin. This will clearly impact man's ability to pursue his fulfillment. Just how it will impact it, though, will depend on what original sin corrupts. Suppose, for instance, that original sin so corrupted our nature that it removed our basic orientation to the good of reason, that to be in a state of original sin meant no longer having the guiding moral principles that Aquinas believes all men naturally possess. Or suppose original sin also destroyed our ability to reason. Suppose it destroyed both. In such a case, it would be easy to see how original sin would render it impossible to pursue one's natural fulfillment. But although Aquinas thinks original sin impairs our ability to seek the good of reason, he doesn't think it destroys it altogether. So there's a lot to Aquinas' view of original sin that I'm not going to go in here, into here. But the important point is this. In Aquinas' view, 
Original sin does not change the fundamental structure of our nature. We don't lose the natural moral knowledge that orients us to the good of reason, and we don't lose reason. What he thinks does happen is that we become much more prone to disordered acts. When I described our natural ability to pursue the good of reason above, I noted that our repeated good acts cause our desires to be in harmony with our reason. But original sin makes the pursuit of this harmony far more difficult. Because of original sin, says Aquinas, the powers of our soul are turned in a disordered way toward changeable goods. Thanks to original sin, we are disposed to prefer our own good to the good of reason. Thanks to original sin, we are predisposed to desire things we shouldn't desire, like wealth or power. Because original sin disposes us to desire these things inordinately, it is that much harder to do the things we ought. The very fact that our soul is disordered in this way will also make it much more difficult for us to reason correctly about how to act. Disordered desires distort how we think about what is good and bad. And because our souls are disordered in that way by original sin, our natural human inclination to virtue is diminished. The reason is simple. Original sin makes us more inclined to sin, more inclined to pursue our desires rather than reason, and less able, thanks to those same disordered desires, to reason correctly about the good. And if we have an increased inclination to act in ways contrary to our fulfillment, it follows that we have a decreased inclination to fulfill it. But what original sin does not do is render it altogether impossible for us to know what the good of reason requires, and it does not, even if it makes it more difficult, render it impossible for us to do it. Okay, now I'm going to shift topics a little bit. I've been arguing that Aquinas sees a link between human goodness and human nature, and I've been giving a sketch of what that goodness consists in. And I've also said that Aquinas thinks original sin impairs one's ability to achieve the goodness that corresponds to our natural human fulfillment. But although Aquinas believes that we pursue a genuine good when we pursue the fulfillment of our rational human nature, and although he believes that even those who suffer the debilitating effects of original sin can make progress toward the fulfillment of their rational human nature, he still understands Christian perfection to be something else. If unbelievers can cultivate genuine moral goodness, why is heaven still off limits? The answer is that although Aquinas thinks we have a human nature, and although he thinks we achieve a genuine kind of goodness by fulfilling that nature, he does not think achieving that kind of fulfillment is the true goal of the Christian moral life. So now I want to explain how, for Aquinas, the perfect virtue the Christian life makes possible differs from the virtue that corresponds to the good of reason. I'm going to go, so going back to Augustine, Augustine distinguishes two different kinds of gifts that God bestows on man. What we receive in order to be is one thing, says Augustine. But what we receive in order to be holy is another. What Augustine is referring to here is sometimes called the twofold gift. As we've already seen, Aquinas, like Augustine, believes that man's very creation is a gift from God. God gives us a great gift by giving us our rational human nature. And when we act in ways ordered to the fulfillment of that rational human nature, we make the best possible use of the gift God gives us in creation. Aristotle and Plato may have known nothing of the Judeo-Christian God, but when they cultivated the right relationship between reason and desire in their souls, they were making good use of the gift of their rational human nature. The key point to understand, though, is that while Augustine and Aquinas acknowledge that our very rational human nature is a gift from God, and while they rightly recognize that human goodness consists in making good use of that gift, They also do not think 
that any degree of success in that endeavor will make us deserving of heaven. Even if every single act the pagan philosophers ever did exemplified the right relation of reason and desire, that still would not suffice to gain them entrance to heaven. Why not? The answer here goes back to our original point about the relationship between a thing's nature and its good. So far, we've been operating on the assumption that all we mean when we say a thing is good is that it fulfills its nature. But the good that Christianity upholds as the goal of human life, heavenly beatitude, is a good that radically exceeds the capacities of human nature. And since it exceeds our capacities, we cannot pursue it through our own power. If we are granted access to this higher good, it is only through God's free gift of grace. The question, then, is how the good upheld by Christianity as the true goal of human life is related to the nature that God gives man in creation. And that's what I'm going to discuss in the remainder. In his famous poem, The Inferno, Dante puts virtuous pagans at the very outskirts of hell. He places them there because he says that they, though virtuous, quote, in right manner loved not God. It's clear, of course, that Dante, like Aquinas, believes that one cannot rightly love God without God saving grace. But the question of what grace does is important. In Aquinas' view, grace does not destroy or replace but perfects our created human nature. Just how Aquinas thinks grace perfects nature, though, is important. He does not think it merely enables us to, do, to better do what our created human nature already directs us to do. He does not, that is to say, think that God's grace merely renders us better or more perfectly able to exhibit right reason in action. Aquinas believes that God's grace perfects and transforms not only what our human fulfillment is, but also the very principles that order us to that fulfillment. I noted in the proceeding that Aquinas thinks we have the ability to pursue the good of reason because we all naturally possess an inchoate knowledge of what that good is. We possess this knowledge insofar as we naturally know certain general, orienting moral principles, such as that good is to be done and evil avoided. In Aquinas' view, a nature transformed by God's saving grace is ordered to participation in the divine life in the same way that man's natural moral knowledge orients him to the good of reason. He believes that faith, hope, and love give man an inchoate knowledge of the goal of the Christian life, heavenly beatitude, just as his natural moral knowledge gives him inchoate knowledge of the good of reason. To rightly love God, then, is to be united to him through the divinely given virtues of faith, hope, and love. And Aquinas uh, believes that these virtues give us a grasp of the divine good in much the same way that naturally known moral principles give us a grasp of the good of reason. And indeed, even faith, hope, and love aren't sufficient. Aquinas thinks that to act in a manner befitting participation in the, in the divine life uh, we also need the help and guidance of the Holy Spirit and infused or God-given ver versions of all the natural moral virtues. Without going into too many details, I'll just return to my original example. Leonidas could recognize on his own that dying to save Greece from the Persian hordes was a good thing to do, and he could cultivate that strength on his own. But in Aquinas' view, recognizing whether martyrdom is required or being a martyr is not something I can do on my own. One needs not only the appropriate relationship to God and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but also a more than human strength. So without going in any of the many directions we could go here, um, the important point I want to make is this. Aquinas has not at all abandoned the view that there is a connection between a thing's good and its nature. Aquinas' view is that grace transforms and perfects what we are, and thus transforms and perfects our good. Without grace, the best we can hope for is the fulfillment of the nature God gives us in creation. This is a genuine kind of fulfillment 
and attaining it is a genuine good. But God's grace, without destroying our rational human nature, perfects and elevates it. And a nature perfected by grace is only fulfilled by participation in the divine life. So the last, but also in some ways the most important thing I want to mention here, is another assertion that Dante makes about the virtuous pagans at the outermost edges of hell. Dante says that virtuous pagans like Plato and Aristotle, quote, live on in desire without hope. The cultivation of natural virtue in Aquinas' eyes is a genuine good, and it produces a genuine kind of happiness. But the happiness of the person who cultivates the natural virtues will never be complete. Far to the contrary, the more we order ourselves to the good of reason, and the more we perfect the gift that God gives us in creation, the more we will become aware that the good of reason cannot fully satisfy our desire the more we will desire a fuller completion which we are powerless to achieve on our own. Indeed, Aquinas will say that the cultivation of natural virtue is itself a preparation for grace. The more we cultivate the natural virtues, the more our souls are prepared to receive the gift of grace. So, at the end of the day, Aquinas thinks that pagans can cultivate a genuine kind of virtue. He just doesn't think that the pagans can cultivate the kind of virtue that the blessed in heaven possess. To some, this might seem unfair. Why should genuinely good people be excluded from heaven? Isn't a God who keeps good people out of heaven unjust? The answer is that in Aquinas' view, indeed in the Christian view, heaven isn't something that anyone deserves. It, like the very gift of our creation, is a gift that God gives us out of his superabundant goodness. What Aquinas offers us in his middle ground is itself a fuller explanation of this. The good of natural virtue is a genuine good because it is the fulfillment of the gift God gives us in creating us. But no amount of natural fulfillment can ever make us worthy of the highest happiness or the highest virtue. Such a gift, should we receive it, is simply a still further and far greater gift from God. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Ooh, thank you so much, Professor Noble. That was wonderful. We have probably about 25 minutes for a question and answer session. So Sam Ong will walk around with the microphone. You just raise your hand. Come answer your question. He won't answer your question. He'll give you the microphone for Professor Noble to answer your question. There is a uh, certain view I've heard that, um, I guess actually I should preface this first by saying that there's some people that they seem to have like such a commitment to certain transcendentals like the truth that it's almost like a faith-like commitment to it. Like they, they sort of perceive it as like a good willing to sacrifice for. Uh, and there are a few people recently that I can especially think of as this that aren't Christians that seem willing to like sacrifice everything for the truth. And there's a certain view that in loving the transcendentals, that's like somehow like loving Christ because the source of all goodness in creation, especially like truth, goodness, and, um, and love and things like that, are like close enough to God as to be something like faith itself that when you recognize those things as good and they orient your life towards the natural good. So what would you say kind of in your opinion between sort of that view of, of living a life ordered towards the good can maybe be enough to merit heaven versus Aquinas' view? Um, did that make sense? And you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, so I, I think I need to get clear on what you're asking. So let me rephrase your question, and you can tell me if that's what you're asking. Um, are, you're saying, like, so we'll stick with truth rather than the other beauty and all those kinds of things. So you're saying, isn't truth important enough that to really kind of devote and follow truth um, is akin to kind of supernatural love for God? Is that what you're saying? So that some, like, like, 
It's coming in and out, this microphone. Um, so Socrates dies for truth. Um, you're saying, doesn't that merit heaven because he died for truth? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty close to what I'm saying. Just to bring it up as, as sort of a challenge to explore. I mean, so I, I think we would want to make some clarifying points, right? So first off, um, you know, oh, uh, you know, Peter Abelard raises the view, which, which Aquinas is not, um, which not, is not opposed to, right, that you could theoretically have God's grace without knowing it, right? Um, so let's exclude that possibility, right, that, that Socrates was saved unbeknownst to himself or something like that. Um, so let's, let's shelve that possibility, right? Um, and so we're just talking about Socrates through his own natural powers, loving truth so much that he's willing to die for it, right? And, and nobody denies that that's a really, really, really good thing, right? Um, I still would nonetheless maintain that that is not the same thing as participation in the divine life and becoming an adopted brother of, of Christ and son of God, right? That, that's a different thing, right? Um, it, I, it, and I don't think it diminishes its goodness at all when we say that, right? You, I think you're living, the, you're doing the best thing a human being can do when you die for truth, right? But truth is something that we, through our own human nature, can recognize as good and pursue, right? And it's, it's quintessential to our human nature that we can love truth and pursue it, right? Um, so we're fulfilling our created human nature when we pursue it. Um, but the, the point is that the fulfillment of our human nature is not what Christianity upholds as the goal, right? And the goal that Christianity upholds is a goal that you can't be ordered to without God, right? So if I answered your question, yes, Socrates merited by dying for truth, I would be a Pelagian. Right? I mean, I would, I would think that I would be claiming that heaven is ours for the taking, right? Because we merit it by, by doing acts that, that we are naturally capable of, right? And I don't want to be a Pelagian, so. No. And, I, and Aquinas didn't want to be a Pelagian either, right? So, um, is that answering your question? You're, you're trying, you're trying hard there. Um, I just don't think that you can merit salvation. Um, Professor Noble, thank you for your talk. Um, please excuse my sunglasses. I forgot my regular glasses, and speaking of not being able to see accurately. <laughs> um, so I have a, a question that um, dovetails with the previous question, and I was wondering if you've considered the distinction between pagans that died before Christ and pagans that died after Christ. And it, I also wonder... Um, I, I'm not well versed in Aquinas. I don't know if Aquinas makes any distinction there either. Um, but I'd be interested in knowing what you have to say about that. Yeah, that's partially. Um, and just even thinking about how integrated the church has been with the classical tradition, specifically with those who were born before Christ. I mean, we think about the influence of Plato on the Christian tradition, especially through the Timaeus 
or we think about the influence of Aristotle on the Christian tradition, especially via Aquinas. Um, and so I guess my question is, you know, but then we think about like the pagan Roman Empire, uh, how they uh, persecuted those in the church, right? They're clearly not relating to the church in the same way. And so I was just... But interestingly, it's the notion, it's, it's the notion um, that there could be even natural virtue that is the radical notion in Christianity, right? So the Christian tradition, well-versed, as you mentioned, in, um, in pagan philosophers, um, uniformly held that there was no virtue, period without God's grace, right? So that they agreed that the pagan philosophers were getting something right, um, but that they were also still very wrong, right? Because if you, had, um, if you had virtue, that came directly from God. And it's not until the appropriation of Aristotle, and again, I'm not making that as a causal claim, but just as a historical claim, it's not until the, the availability of, the tra of Latin translations of Aristotle that you begin to see a shift, right? And you begin to see this, this um, b willingness to recognize the possibility of some genuine goodness um, in, an, in somebody who, say, in an unbeliever, right? And, it's, and um, so it, the, um, the momentum is in the opposite, it's almost in the opposite direction, right? I mean, we, when we think of virtue, we tend to think Aristotle, right? And, and the, all the Christian notions, this idea of a virtue divinely given and things like that, that's usually what we hear about last, right? But for the Christian tradition that was just beginning, right, to have the works of Aristotle available, it was the opposite, right? And so Aquinas is um, supposed to be unique for not shunning Aristotle, right? Not shunning him altogether. Um, however, um, what I would resist is a propensity to push the ball too much forward and say, well, Aristotle just took Aristotle and said, well, just sprinkle some holy water on Aristotle and you're done, right? That wasn't Aristotle. That wasn't Aquinas either, right? Aquinas is walking this very, I think, sophisticated middle ground where he says, those who are not, who have, who have not accepted Christ can be good, because our nature is good, and they can still perfect that good nature that we received in creation. But beatitude is something else. Heavenly beatitude is something else. None of that is to exclude the possibility, of course, right, that certain, that um, someone who hadn't heard, heard of Christ could be saved. That's not right, and there's a, you know, um, one person that received a lot of, um, speculation uh, among the early Christians was Trajan, right? The Roman emperor Trajan. Now, here's a guy who thinks he's like a god himself, right? So he's, he's clearly not on, he, not on the program. But he did, you know, he, he was very reluctant to persecute Christians. He built uh, orphanages. He instituted a welfare system. He seems to have been a good guy. And so there's, there, you find discussion... Um, of what was going on here, right? Maybe somehow he was saved without knowing it, things like that. So there certainly is a willingness to recognize the goodness, um, but I don't think anybody would ever have said that uh, somebody who hadn't heard about Christ could have been saved except through unknowingly receiving the gift of God's grace. Very much. There we go. I. 
question series. I have a couple questions. Oh my goodness. Each other. Just talk. I have a couple. Keep going. So you're not worried necessarily about whether the person is getting it right or wrong, but about how you can tell whether the person is getting it right or wrong? So, I, okay, yeah, give me an example. I mean, I absent trying to get to the bottom of why he thinks two plus two is five, I'm not sure that you could arrive at that answer. But then, I mean, I, I also think that, um, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, so I'm, I'm trying to shift back to the, to the moral question away from the two plus two is five, which seems much more, um, Morality for Aquinas and Aristotle is not a um, science in the sense that you can start with your given premises and deduce conclusions. And if somebody comes up with a wrong conclusion, you say, you see, you missed this step. Show your work, right? And then, and then it'll all be okay, right? Um, it it requires... How... Um, it requires that you be rightly ordered to the goals of the moral life. And if you're not rightly ordered to those goals, your reasoning is going to go astray. And so it requires not only that they be appropriately ordered, but also you in evaluating them, it requires that you be appropriately ordered. So it's a, it's a much more complicated, it's a much more complicated thing, I think. Um, but I, I guess I'm also a little bit surprised to hear that the that the problem is whether is is determining the degree of their moral depravity, right? I mean, I think that a, a, maybe a better starting point would be kind of um, working, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it would be perhaps working on our own moral state um, as much as, as much as, as trying to evaluate theirs. Right? I mean, I don't know. It's a, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Noble, for coming out and giving this uh, talk. Uh, it was helpful to kind of clear up a minor heresy, I guess, I believe in, or I'd been told, uh, was that people such as Gandhi, for instance, would be able to make it to heaven uh, because they did good things. Uh, so I appreciate you clarifying that uh, heretic there. So you mentioned during the talk, the heresy there, but uh, you mentioned during the talk that the perfection of human virtue isn't the purpose of being a Christian. And you kind of talked about faith, hope, and love. Uh, so would you say that Aquinas's ideal of being a Christian would be um, strengthening your faith and others' faith in Christ, uh, living hope, 
uh, for the resurrection and the coming back of Christ and really loving um, in a Christian manner? Or how would you define uh, what is ideal of being a Christian? What, what, what's kind of that standard of being a Christian that's not uh, living up to the highest moral virtue? Okay, so I wasn't saying that Gandhi is not in heaven. I don't know, right? All I'm saying is <laughs> you don't earn heaven <laughs> by, by kind of going out and, and achieving it, right? So um, heaven is not ours for the taking. Um, but that's not to say God can't give his grace where he, where he wants to give his grace. Okay, with that said, you asked a more important question, right, which is what I think the, what do I think the goal is if I don't think it is cultivating what I call the natural moral virtues, right? Um, Aquinas, I, I kind of skipped over this briefly, but Aquinas has, has the interesting view, which is the um, Orthodox Christian view in the tradition from which he comes, that um, in baptism we receive not just grace, right, which you, makes us participants in the divine life, and not just faith, hope, and love, which kind of order us towards participation in the divine life, but in fact all um, the moral virtues, right? Just divinely given versions of them, right? So we receive the ability to stand firm in the face of danger for the sake of God. We receive the ability to, um, you know, be temperate for the sake of God. Aquinas thinks that the virtues that enable us to do, to really act in a manner befitting our divine adoption also have to be given us by God. The virtues that we can cultivate that are ordered to the good of reason can kind of make us pliant, right? Dispose us towards those higher virtues, but he doesn't think that those are the same thing. Um, there's a lot more to be said, but I have a book you can buy. No, I was kidding. Um, but, um, <laughs> Um, no, I mean, there, there's a really a lot more to be said there. Um, and I, I think, I mean, one of the, one of the um, interesting things is that, I, you know, the, he, um, the courage of Leonidas and the courage of the Christian, right, if you've got uh, two people in, in the gap fighting the, the Spartan hordes and one is a Christian and one is Leonidas, it's not clear that their actions are going to look all that different from each other right? But importantly, Aquinas does think it's a very different thing, right? That I am doing something very different when I die for love of God than when I um, order my acts towards a, towards a good that reason can grasp, right? Um, when I act out of my own power. Is that helping? Yeah. Okay. Hi, Professor. Thank you for your talk. Um, I just want to be very careful about how I phrase my question because um, there are many people that I respect intellectually and morally in these other traditions. Um, but specifically, there are, I would say, two um, traditions of like non-Catholic um, groups that want to promote virtue in our world, and specifically uh, followers of Leo Strauss and even someone who's become very popular, Jordan Peterson. And I guess my question is, is uh, what do you think, what kind of relationship should Catholics have with these like alternative projects to promote virtue in the world. Jumping on natural virtue. I don't mean to dump on it at all. I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. I think it's important. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's true, right? So I think when people are, I mean, without weighing in on the respective projects of any one individual person, right? But when people are pursuing truth, um, obviously we ought to join in wholeheartedly. Um, the only thing that I, would, that I would be resistant to is equating Aristotelian virtue with Christian virtue. I think those are two different things. I don't think that they... Um, um, it's, not, it's not as if um, they're equivocal notions at all, right? So I, I wouldn't want to say that, um, yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot that is, that is similar, right? Um, most importantly, the fulfillment of nature, right? So if you, if you understand 
virtue as about cultivating um, habits that enable you to express right reason in action, right? That's, that's great, right? They're, they're, but um, the Christian tradition, and Aquinas has, I think, a beautiful account of what happens there. The Christian tradition believes that there is a higher truth, right? A truth that absorbs all, right? That absorbs the truth that we can recognize through our own power uh, and elevates it, right? So it's not as if there's a dichotomy there. It's not as if um, Plato and Aristotle weren't doing something good, right? They were at the very limits of the goodness that human beings can do, right? And that's why I think Dante's image is so beautiful. They've they want, but they know that there's something more, right? So, yeah, I think, I think that um, contemporary e efforts to revive the virtues are great. All right, I think this will be the second to last question. So earlier in, I think, the Q&A session, you talked about how gratitude for God's, you know, the freeness of creation um, that's kind of the starting and ending point of moral inquiry when we talk about our ends and our supernatural ends. And, you know, there's a lot of wisdom to that. And we talked about Dante's pagans in limbo um, and, you, you know, how they did find their natural end and, you know. But there does seem to be something unsatisfactory um, in an appraisal of God's justice when we talk about, you know, whenever you make a thing, it's just to enable the thing to be able to fulfill its end. And so it seems unsatisfactory to say they can reach their ends, but only one of them. Like, it seems to reflect a lack of justice on God's part um, for these pre-incarnation pagans not to be able to achieve their highest end. Um, how would you, yeah, so I guess, how would you talk about supernatural ends and justice um, and whether God is unjust? Um, I wonder... Whether you know it or not, you're kind of articulating that is the, the controversy over the single versus twofold end in Aquinas. You probably, yeah. <laughs> um, um, right, and so that, that's one argument, right? That if, um, if we're, so some people think that um, the, the correct, the, 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 the correct thing to say about human nature and, and what it is that human natures naturally desire is that they naturally, you know, our heart is restless till it rests in thee, that we naturally desire God, right? Um, and other people say, whoa, wait a minute, you can't say that, right? Because if you say that we by nature desire um, supernatural beatitude, then we by nature have a desire that we cannot fulfill. And every good Aristotelian knows, right, that there has to be a correlation between inclinations and ability to fulfill, right? And so God created, would have created this monstrosity that we have this desire that we lack the resources to, to fulfill, and that would be an injustice, right? Hence, it, ha it would have to be the case that God created us only with a desire for our natural perfection, right? Um, and then later we get a desire for supernatural perfection, and then it's all neat and tidy, right? Um, now, and the, here's the thing about that debate. I get a little impatient with this debate. Um, I just do, because I think that um, it ends up, both sides end up kind of caric making caricatures of the other, okay? Um, is it the case that something with a desire that it cannot, that, that, um, God has done an injustice to Plato and Aristotle looking on, right, in looking on with um, desire but without hope. Well, only if you think that um, God has done an injustice by giving something um, a, a, a potential that it cannot fulfill through its own resources, right? Um, and many defenders of the single end view just say, yeah, okay. Right? It would be a problem for Aristotle. Aquinas is an Aristotle. Get over it. Right? So what, they just say there's no injustice there. Um, now, on the other hand, 
and, and, and those same people say, why would I say that God gives me only a desire for my natural fulfillment? Right? Because if that's all God gives me, and if I have the resources to fulfill it, why are Plato and Aristotle wanting anything? Aren't they just done? Aren't they totally happy? And if that's the case, why pursue heaven at all? You're done, right? You got natural virtue. Go home, right? You're fulfilled. You have happiness. There's nothing more to want, right? But that's, that's not fair to the double-end view, right? Because even defenders of, of um, the, view, the other view, the injustice view, right, they say, well, okay, right, you're, yes, your, order, your only end is, is the fulfillment that you can achieve through your own power, and that's your end. But once you get it, then you want something else, right? You, you're still not, right, your, your desire is not at rest. Um, so I, the, I, I, I think that there's more agreement between the two, right? I think both sides of the debate agree that the heart is restless until it rests in God. They just disagree about how to describe the restlessness, right? Um, and I, I'm not, I don't find the injustice claim super convincing, to be honest, um, because I think it depends on a certain reading of Aquinas, right? Um, and specifically a reading of, of the divine ideas and what's going on there. And I don't know a lot about the divine ideas, but I know people who know a lot about the divine ideas, and they, they disagree with that, with that reading, that um, Aquinas is, would be committed to the idea that God had created an injustice if he gave you a potency that you couldn't actualize through your own powers. Um, so it's, it's complicated and interesting stuff, but that's, as, that's my answer for you. So I guess my question was going off of Hannah's, if maybe you could resolve that issue by saying something along the lines of like, just because people have a desire for food and maybe starve to death because of the sins of other people, you could say that like, there's no injustice here because God made us to be able to fulfill this desire, but it's only because of the sins of Adam and Eve that we aren't able to. So it's really... No. All right, go ahead. Well, I was... That was the, the gist of my question. It's sort of like, instead of blaming the sort of like, it's like God giving us a desire that we can't fulfill injustice, like in the same way that maybe someone would, would starve or lack some of the natural things that they need or that they have a desire for, and we blame that kind of injustice on human evil, if you could just resolve this debate by blaming it all on the sins of Adam and Eve and, and the... So, sorry, I, so the reason I started shaking my head there was, I mean, I don't think we can blame Adam and Eve right? Because um, at least for Aquinas, Adam and Eve are in a state of grace, right? Um, and so they're not um, reaching heaven through their own powers either. And second, I think the, the, the point Hannah was making, or, or the, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a philosophical point, right? I mean, imagine that God made a giraffe with all the giraffiness um, wanting to eat leaves and everything else, and he gave it a really short neck, right? That, that seems like that would be cruel, right? That that would be, there would be something wrong with creation if you gave a giraffe, like, a really short neck, right? There would be, you would have thwarted it, right? Um, but what I was, what I was kind of pushing back against was, uh, or what I, the question I was raising is whether it would be accurate to compare someone desiring God and being unable to reach it, um, to reach God through their own powers to a giraffe with a really short neck, right? Um, because you, you do have a nature and you can achieve everything commensurate to your nature. You, you can do all of that. But God also gives you the potential, the, the possibility of something higher that you can't reach through your own powers. So it's, it's not as if there's anything lacking from your nature, but there is also a potential, right, that you, um, that you, have, that you have the capacity for but can't realize on your own. 